Okay, so we back in Connecticut, New Haven, also known as Pistol Waving New Haven to be precise. Most of you should be familiar with the name, State Property. State Property is a rap group from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, led by rapper Beanie Siegel with Philadelphia rappers, Freeway, Petey Crack, Oskino Vasquez, and Emilio Sparks, and the duo, Young Guns, Young Chris and Neef Book. State Property was signed to Jay-Z's Rockefeller Records, and also produced two movies self-titled, State Property. They are definitely worth a watch if you are into hood flicks. Today's story doesn't deal with the immediate state property members per se, but talks about 365 Entertainment, guys who promoted and had a relationship with state property before things went left. Enough of that though, let's get into it. Four men, Ziggy, Darky B, Lead and Johnny J, were members of the Island Brothers, a gang based in the Quinnipiac Terrace housing complex. They were convicted of murdering Jason and shooting two others, Dre and Bub, around 2 a.m. on December 14, 1996, in the courtyard of the Farnham Courts housing complex. Jason, Dre, and Bub were members of the Ghetto Boys, a gang based in Farnham Courts. Weeks later, police obtained warrants to arrest the four friends for the murder, largely on the testimony of two of the other shooting victims. The four were given sentences ranging from 75 to 100 years. They ranged in age from 18 to 21 at the time of the murder. Bub and Dre, who's Jason's cousin, survived and went on to serve as the two key witnesses for the state. As for Darky B, he formerly made music under that name, Darky B. In 1999, he released a cassette with two singles, Sad Thug's Song, and one called Connecticut. After this, he would be locked up for the murder and start his life sentence. After serving 13 and a half years and 17 years in prison between the four men, things changed. On July 25, 2013, Ziggy, Darky B, Leet, and Johnny J walked out of State Superior Court on New Haven's Church Street into the arms of their family and into freedom. The Connecticut Supreme Court ordered them to be freed because the state had messed up at their trial. The state's key witness had testified that he hadn't struck a deal to have any charges reduced in any separate criminal cases against him. It turned out he had. And the state hadn't corrected the record. Also, no weapons were recovered for the murder. The only physical evidence that allegedly placed the defendants at the scene was a yellow jacket. Dre and his 15-year-old brother both testified that the shooter wore a yellow jacket and Ziggy was wearing a yellow jacket when he was arrested. The relevance of the jacket depended on the reliability of the witnesses. Initially though, one of the shooting victims, Bub, after fumbling between which of the four men were involved, told two officers that the shooters were Ziggy, Darky V, Leet, and Johnny J. At one point, he mentioned another guy, Lord, who was Johnny J's brother and considered a higher ranking member of the Island Brothers. We will talk more about him later in the story. A detective prepared a photographic array that included each suspect placed randomly within a sequence of seven lookalike photographs. Bub was handed the stack of 32 photographs and identified the four men he previously identified. Here's where things get tricky. Dre, who was shot nine times in the situation, did not identify the shooters until March 1999, three months after he had been charged with carrying a pistol without a permit and two counts of possession of narcotics. He pleaded guilty and faced a sentence of up to 35 years. But the judge said his sentence would be capped at four years with a right to argue for less, provided he cooperated with the state. Sentencing was postponed. A few months later, Dre was called to testify at the trial of Ziggy, Darky B, Lead and Johnny J. When asked whether the state had extended any offers of consideration to him in exchange for his testimony, he said no, he agreed to testify simply out of a desire for justice. When asked if he expected to receive the full sentence, he said, you do the crime, you got to do the time, if they give me the full sentence, they give me the full sentence. The prosecutor, former senior assistant state's attorney, did not disclose to the defense or court that Dre had entered a guilty plea. Nor did he disclose that the trial court had indicated it would impose a sentence cap of four years, provided Dre cooperated. The U.S. Supreme Court ruled that the suppression by the prosecution of evidence favorable to a defendant violates due process, and the conviction must be set aside if there is any reasonable likelihood the judgment of the jury was affected. It was decided that the men would not be retried, and Dre had in fact been killed in 2008. When Dre showed up to a Fairhaven apartment complex to put his grandmother to bed, he was gunned down in the parking lot. He would visit his grandmother, who was in her mid-80s and in frail condition, every night around 8 p.m. 
That night, gunshots were reported in the area at about 9 p.m., according to police. Police responded, but found no crime scene at the time. They got a second call to the area at 2.23 a.m., reporting a dead body. Dre had laid bleeding on a sidewalk for hours until police found his body. He was pronounced dead at the scene. That's what ended up happening with Dre. As for the four men charged in connection to the Jason Smith murder, they would file suit for wrongful prosecution. In a settlement with the state, they each received $4.2 million and a second chance at rebuilding their lives. $2.4 million for loss of liberty, $1.1 million for loss of earnings and future earnings capacity, $200,000 for loss of reputation, $100,000 for physical and mental injuries, and $200,000 for legal fees and expenses, according to a report in the Connecticut Mirror. Before we proceed, let's do a little background and get into the testimonies which landed the four men in prison. During the mid-90s, during the relevant time period, relations between the Island Brothers and the Ghetto Boys were extremely hostile, and the gangs were shooting at each other on a regular basis. Tyrese, Wigan, Dave, Cloud and Brucey e. B. were members of the Island Boys from Quinnipiac Terrace. On October 7, 1996, at approximately 11.15 p.m., the gang members went to Farnham Court, also located in New Haven, and referred to as the Ghetto. Cloud stayed in the car, while Tyrese, Wigan, Dave and Brucey e. B., with guns at their sides, went looking for the Ghetto Boys. The four men entered the housing project through a hole in a fence. As they approached, they noticed Duane, Chase, B.O. and Bino, who were standing and talking near a green electrical box. When the Ghetto Boys and the others noticed the gang members approaching, Duane exclaimed, shoot the mother effers, and a gunfight ensued. When the first shots were fired, Island Boys, Wigan and Brucey e. B., ran for cover behind a dumpster, and Tyrese ran diagonally across a parking lot located in the complex. Both sides exchanged a barrage of gunfire. As Wigan, Brucey e. B. and Tyrese retreated from the complex, Tyrese was shot in the leg. He continued to hobble quickly away from the complex until another bullet struck him and he collapsed. Wigan and Brucey e. B. went back into the complex and found Tyrese sitting up against a wall. The two picked up Tyrese and carried him to the car. Cloud, David D., Brucey e. B. and Wigan took Tyrese to Yale New Haven Hospital, where he died from his injuries. The autopsy revealed that Tyrese suffered two bullet wounds, one of which was fatal. One bullet, a 9mm round, entered the lower front portion of Tyree's right leg and exited from the back of it. The other bullet, a 44 caliber round, which caused the fatal wound, entered through the upper right side of Tyree's chest just below his collarbone and then penetrated his chest wall, right lung, heart, diaphragm, part of his liver and organs of his abdomen, and eventually lodged in his abdominal cavity. Upset about Tyrese's life, the Island brothers had decided to kill one ghetto boy for every year of Tyrese's life. Tyrese was 16 when he was killed. So let's hear what happened based on the testimonies. At approximately 10 p.m. on December 13, 1996, members of the Island boys met at the Melbus Club in New Haven, a nightclub that was only a short walk from Farnham Courts. The men left the nightclub around 2 a.m. and arrived in the courtyard located in Farnham Courts between Franklin Street and Hamilton Street. All four were armed, and as they entered a courtyard in the project, they fired on the three victims Bub, Jason, and Dre, who was the brother of Duane that was involved in the Tyrese murder. Jason died in the shooting, and Dre and Bub were seriously injured as a result of the attack. At trial, the state called Bub, who testified that as he and the other victims stood in the courtyard at the project around 2 a.m. on December 14, 1996, four individuals emerged from a nearby tunnel. Shortly after 2 a.m., Dre, Bub, Jason and Terrence, who were gathered in the courtyard, were fired on by men wielding semi-automatic weapons. Bub stated that he recognized them as Ziggy, Darky B, Johnny J and Leet, and that they all were firing guns. A detective who was familiar with the gang war testified that after the December 14, 1996 shooting, he was sent to locate Ziggy, Johnny J and A. He found them together at Johnny J's house at approximately 11 a.m. A photographer testified that he was working at the Melbus Club on the night of the shooting. He identified several photographs that he took that night, and the photographs were admitted into evidence. The photographer identified three of the individuals in the photographs as Ziggy, Darky B and Leet. But there was no indication that Johnny J was in attendance. During the attack though, Bub was shot in the left leg, causing him to fall to the pavement. As he lay on the ground, he looked up and saw Darky B and Johnny J standing over him. 
At the same time, he heard more shooting coming from the direction of the location of Jason. The jury also heard the following testimony from Charles, the brother of Dre and cousin of Jason, who was killed. Charles, who was 15 years old at the time of the shooting, testified that he arrived at the scene looking for his brother after the initial volley of gunfire. He saw two people on the ground. He saw a person standing over one of them, whom he later learned was Jason. Although he could not identify the person standing over Jason, he heard him say, do you want to die? I'm from the island. The person then fired his weapon down toward Jason. Charles also saw someone wearing a yellow jacket with a letter P on the back running toward a tunnel that served as an exit from the courtyard. The other wounded man on the ground was Bub. More shooting followed, after which Charles saw someone in a yellow and black jacket running away. The person in the yellow and black jacket was not the same person who had been standing over Jason. The state presented the following additional testimony regarding the yellow and black jacket. The detective we spoke of earlier testified that when he arrested Ziggy on the morning of December 14, 1996, Ziggy was wearing a yellow and black jacket. He also had a bulletproof vest. Charles identified the jacket in the photograph as the same one he saw on the person running away after the shooting. An expert from the Department of Public Safety Forensics Laboratory testified regarding the ballistics evidence recovered from the crime scene and from the victim's bodies. His opinion was that all of the bullets recovered, with the exception of bullet fragments recovered from Jason's brain, were fired from two weapons. He testified that the fragments recovered from Jason's brain were too damaged to be identified. That's about it for the testimonies though. As for Bub he would later be sentenced to 66 months on a drug charge in 2014. He was indicted along with Grape Street Crips leader, Maine. Maine and Bub have the same last name, not sure if they are related though. Anyway, we already stated the reason why the four men ended up being freed for the murder and the shootings, and there were other technicalities that worked in their favor as well. The four men got $4.2 million each and began trying to make their money work for them through investments. This included Johnny J, who would try his hand in music. He together with his co-defendants founded a concerts and events company called 365 Entertainment. There they managed musical talents. Oskino and Petey Crack from State Property were also signed to Johnny J at one point. Johnny J was all into it, there was Easter basket giveaways, and in addition to putting shows together for State Property, he promoted other talents as well. He also ventured south and set up 365 South, managing acts in North Carolina. He helped a lot of people, he even helped pay for funerals. But sometime, he wished he never got that $4.2 million, because many people had their hands out. Things would take a turn in 2019, when police officers responded to a medical center in North Carolina around 2 a.m. on February 23, in reference to a gunshot victim. Upon further investigation, officers determined the victim, 36, had been shot outside the Jamaica House Sports Bar and Grill on Carolina Beach Road. Johnny J, 40 at the time, was arrested by members of the U.S. Marshals Fugitive Task Force with the Wilmington Police Department after locating him in Brunswick County. He was charged with assault with a deadly weapon with intent to kill and possession of a firearm by a felon. Not sure if he ever did any time for this or was convicted. During the COVID-19 pandemic though, he opened a spot called The Oars on North Front Street in Wilmington, North Carolina. The three-story establishment included a bar, a restaurant seating area, and a hookah lounge, and featured live entertainment. It was said to be a nice place, and Johnny J's mother sometimes cooked at the restaurant, where the menu featured chicken and macaroni and cheese, among other dishes. At 1.30 a.m., November 7, 2021, Johnny J was on Chestnut Street in Wilmington, North Carolina, around the corner from his Dior's bar and lounge, when someone shot him. Officers arrived on the scene and immediately rendered aid, but sadly, Johnny J succumbed to his injuries. Johnny J was 43 years old. He left behind five children. Police had already arrested two men, one 22 and 25, in conjunction with the shooting. The men have been charged with first-degree murder and possession of a firearm by a convicted felon. The news of Johnny J's death spread fast in New Haven and Hamden, where he remained connected online and in person to hundreds of people. It was a sad day. You may or may not remember us mentioning a man named Lord earlier, Lord was Johnny J's brother, and his name was brought up in the 1996 murder trial. He had his own trial going as well. Let's talk a little bit about that. 
In November of 1996, two ghetto boys, Ken and Dan, were injured in a shootout with members of the Island Brothers. It was alleged to have went down like this. A vehicle drove behind an automobile being driven by Dan. Either Lord or an accomplice riding in his automobile fired on Dan automobile. Dan sustained a gunshot wound to his shoulder and lost control of his automobile, causing it to crash into two vehicles parked nearby. Dan's passenger, Ken, a member of the Ghetto Boy Street Gang, sustained a gunshot wound to his elbow. Based on Ken's witness statement, Lord was convicted of first-degree assault and conspiracy to commit assault and sentenced to 29 years in prison. Lord was 21 at the time. In a signed 2018 affidavit, which was publicly released, Ken admitted to framing Lord in exchange for avoiding a mandatory prison sentence for felony gun possession. I gave police a false statement implicating Lord in the shooting because the detective who I gave the statement to promised to help keep me out of jail for the illegal gun I was carrying, Ken wrote. Following Ken's now declared false statement, the state charged Lord with a weapons violation. Months after that, on May 28, 1997, a judge granted Ken advanced rehabilitation on charges related to the same shootout. That decision kept Ken out of prison and erased his felony gun charge from his public record. One of Lord's attorneys, a New Haven criminal defense lawyer, also said that four months after Lord was arrested, police caught another man in possession of the same gun the victims were shot with in the November 1996 shooting. The man lived on the corner of East and Humphrey Streets at the scene where Ken and Dan were shot. Yet, the police made no effort to investigate whether that individual was responsible for the shooting, instead proceeded with the prosecution of Lord. His case was investigated by the New Haven police detective who was the witness to the allegedly false original witness statement. The same state's attorney offered a witness a reduced jail sentence for a separate criminal case, in return for his testimony as part of a 1994 murder trial. After asking for sentence reduction and all the other technicalities involved, in the early 2020s Lord would be released after serving 20-plus years for the wrongful conviction. He'd go on to advocate for people who are falsely imprisoned, sometime accompanied by Darkie B, who also supports the agenda. We should also mention that when Darkie B released that cassette back in 99, it was under Rise and Shine Records. Lord had a lot to do with that, it was a lifestyle. If you know you know. But this about wraps it up for this one. Before we go, we will say, in 2019, there was a large indictment in New Haven. The arrests were a result of an investigation headed by the FBI's New Haven Safe Streets Gang Task Force and New Haven Police Department, targeting drug trafficking and related acts of violence by members, former members and associates of the Island Brothers Street Gang. The investigation included court-authorized wiretaps and controlled purchases of narcotics and revealed that the drug trafficking organization had established a base of operation in Fitchburg, Massachusetts. The investigation subsequently identified a second drug trafficking network that involved the large-scale distribution of heroin. There was alleged to be a murder of murders involved as well. But we will discuss that later down the line. But yeah, this one is wrapped up, and as always, stay low and thanks for watching.